it's a great pleasure to um, introduce to you the chair of the Research America Board of Directors, former governor, former congressman, Mike Castle. Mike. Do you want to speak here? Right here? Right. Th thank you, Mary, very, very much. Uh, um, I'm honored to be chair of Research America. I, I must share a story with you, though. I uh, attended uh, Hamilton College, and nobody had told me there were a lot of pre-med students there, and I decided to uh, meet this science requirement. I would take a biology class. Not that I th ever thought I'd be a medical researcher or a doctor or anything of that nature. Uh, after that class was over, I knew I was never going to be anything like that. I became an economics major, went on to be a lawyer, uh, and a, a politician, so um, that, that's my, my story. So I am, but I'm, ha I'm delighted to be involved with Research America and all that Research America is, is doing. Uh, I would like to thank uh, not only the uh, fourth panel, but all the panels uh, who spoke today. I learned a lot, certainly, and I hope all of you did as well. Uh, I think they did a wonderful job uh, from the top to bottom sharing their expertise and insights with us. Uh, speaking of expertise and insights, our closing speaker is Acting Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Ned Sharpless. Dr. Sharpless became Acting FDA Commissioner in April of 2019 this year. Before taking on this crucial, demanding role, he fulfilled another, an esteemed oncologist and veteran researcher, Dr. Sharpless, served as the director of the National Cancer Institute at NIH. Among the many other ways Dr. Sharpless has contributed to faster medical and public health progress, he served as the director of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC Chapel Hill, as editor of several prestigious peer-reviewed journals, and as author and, and co-author of more than 170 reports, reviews, and book chapters. And just before I call him in. I'd just like to make a pitch for Research America, and perhaps in a different way. I don't, I'm preaching to the choir, I know that, to the people who are here. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, working in a law firm, uh, both in Wilmington, Delaware, where I live, and in Washington, D.C., where, where we had offices, uh, I was surprised at the people who did not know uh, of the work of Research America. I, I can tell you that the work, not just of Mary Woolley, but of Mary and her staff, uh, and all those people who serve on this board uh, have made a big difference uh, in things like getting 21st century cures done, uh, in getting uh, extra financing uh, for medical research done. Uh, just again and again, uh, it has been a very positive experience. Uh, and I would hope as uh, you go about talking to people, you remind them uh, that Research America is out doing the best it can to help with all those things. Uh, but uh, with that uh, little advertisement, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, without further delay, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sharpless uh, to the podium. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Castle, for that warm introduction. It's great to be here. I want to thank our Research America for convening this important forum to talk about uh, issues we face in medical society today, uh, but also for its long-term leadership in uh, recognizing the need for quality research uh, to improve medicine and health. And I, I've been familiar with Research America for a while now, and I, I found them to be the marvelous advocates for science that Governor Castle described. I started my career as an academic bio biomedical researcher and a, and a, and a doctor, I, uh, taking care of patients with blood cancer uh, for many years. And uh, given that background, I really can't think of any topic more important than producing the best research uh, to provide the best data that's needed to develop new treatments for our patients. My formative experience in this regard occurred between my second and third year of medical school when I took a year off to go work at the NIH in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Research Scholars Program, and I uh, worked on AIDS dementia. And uh, that experience helped me appreciate the art of generating, generating and analyzing my own data, and it really fostered my love of science. And within a few weeks of starting at, that, uh, at the NIH, uh, you know, people, my friends would call me and say, how do you like uh, working in the lab? And I would say, this is the best year of my life. And that's turned out to be true uh, even now in hindsight. <laughs> 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 uh, 
It's also fostered uh, my belief in uh, opportunities for doing good through science and medicine. So not surprisingly, when I left the lab back then, I went back to med school and then I did a residency and fellowship and uh, training in medical oncology and, and went into clinical practice. And, 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 and I think I, I became frustrated by um, the limited options that we had for patients. So to be clear, taking care of patients with cancer is an immense privilege and it's a wonderful thing to do and I really enjoy clinical oncology and loved that, the practice of medicine. But I also hated that it felt like the sort of recurring nightmare of having patients come in with metastatic cancer, giving them the same treatment over and over again, watching it fail. It reminds me, some, some of you probably remember that first generation of that robot that vacuums your floor. You know, the Roomba that like would bump into the chair and back up and bump into the chair again. And it would do that over and over again. That was, that was oncology in the 1990s. It was sort of doing the same thing, with a few exceptions. I mean, we had some areas where treatments worked, but for the most part, it was a very frustrating endeavor. The drugs really didn't work. Uh, and it was uh, very tough to be an oncologist back then, and it was even, frankly, worse for the patients. Uh, and that fact really sent me back to the lab. You know, I, I wanted to do better. I wanted to use science to try and improve care for patients with cancer. And so uh, I left clinical oncology, or you know, grew, vastly decreased my practice in clinical oncology, so I, could become a, so I could become a molecular biologist and cancer geneticist in earnest. And uh, that really, uh, at the time, seemed like an immense demotion, as you can imagine. You know, you were this clinical fellow at Harvard where people from all over New England were coming to see you and get your, advice, get your advice on cancer. And then all of a sudden, you go into a lab and, like, the stir bar, you know, that you make to use buffers won't work for you properly. It, like, bounces around like a Mexican jumping bean in the bottom of the thing. Uh, and you have to ask the sort of 18-year-old summer student, like, how do you get that damn thing to work? <laughs> And th that was a, a terrible uh, transformative experience, but you know, I went through it because at the end of it, you know, I was a scientist and I could, I could do science that would uh, be useful for cancer patients. And that effort's what it's really all about. You know, our commitments to the search for reliable and rigorous data so that we can find the answers for our patients, the answers that they need uh, you know, to have a cure or, or an effective treatment or just, just in some cases the hope for an effective treatment sometime on the horizon. And I have to say, we, we live in a, in a privileged, extraordinary time of scientific progress where there's been enormous transformational movement in medicine. And uh, I've been particularly lucky in this regard since I would argue that you know, the progress in cancer research has been particularly uh, impressive and breathtaking. You know, the battle days of the 1990s I described are no more in medical oncology. You know, in the last few years, the last two decades in particular, the pace of progress has really been dramatic. And take a disease like malignant melanoma, when I was a fellow at the Dana-Farber in 1995, that disease was about the worst cancer imaginable. That was a diagnosis in the metastatic setting that we seldom to never cured. It was a, a grim sentence. Patients uh, rapidly succumbed to that disease. And we did hundreds, if not thousands, of clinical trials that provided no useful benefit for the patients. And then, uh, after a lot of investigation about the molecular biology of that cancer, in 2011, we finally started to have some breakthroughs. And uh, I remember it was 2011 because uh, my father died of melanoma in 2010, uh, about a year before these drugs really started to work. And that was a cruel irony given that I had studied melanoma my entire career as a researcher. Uh, but with a new biological understanding of that disease and the immune response to cancer, we developed several effective therapies in rapid succession. And over sort of a five-year remarkable period starting then, you know, five to, or more uh, really active drugs in melanoma uh, became available. And we took a disease that effectively had sort of a 0% or a 3% long-term cure rate to a disease that now is, you know, on the order of 60 to 70% of patients are cured. The majority of patients with metastatic melanoma today are cured. They're like Jimmy Carter. You know, they get treated with brain metastasis and other sorts of metastatic disease and then go and build habitat for humanity houses later on. So that's the kind of progress we have seen against one of the most ghastly cancers imaginable. To be clear, we still have a long way to go in cancer, and it's perhaps the leading cause of death in this country now, or soon will be, and there's too many children dying of cancer, as I, I used to say a lot when I was in NCI. But nonetheless, one has to admit that the progress in this disease, or this you know, collection of related diseases, has really been remarkable. And it's clear to me that the, to make additional progress in cancer or any other area of medical research, we need more and better research. And you know, what I've just said for cancer is true, really, I would argue, for all areas of medicine. In fact, I would argue maybe even more needed in areas other than cancer, 
where our progress has not been as good as in that disease. Just take the uh, things that begin with the letter A, Alzheimer's, antimicrobial resistance, arthritis, ALS, aging. You know, that's just one letter of the alphabet, and those are areas where I think we'd all like to see more progress, where it hasn't been what we've seen, for example, in cancer. Which brings me back to the session. You know, the title is Leveraging Data to Accelerate Medical Progress, and I think this captures two of the most critical <laughs> Uh, issues we face in the medical research community and at the FDA specifically. First, what types of data do we need? You know, wh what are the means whereby we get those data and in a manner that is efficient and respectful and values patient privacy and follows the rules? Second, how can we use these data uh, and their downstream technological advances to really turn them into uh, medical products and, tra and treatments that make a difference in patients' lives? And at a time of limited resources and enormous scientific challenges, we want to make the most of these precious uh, scientific investments. We want to maximize the payoff of our efforts. That rings especially true to me in the area of data science, where uh, it's crucial that not only do we aggregate good data, but then we use the cutting edge novel analytic tools to analyze those data. Nothing seems more frustrating to me than imagining you get these great data sets together that are multimodal and linked and have uh, you know, the, the variety of kinds of data you want in there, and then the data set is too large and too cumbersome and, and too difficult to mine, and, and, and the, the result, the answer you seek is just literally trapped in the data set. And uh, using appropriate analytical techniques, we need to solve these problems. So by gathering better quality data and using uh, analytical tools that are developing, we can more effectively make scientific progress, find additional answers, develop new products, and ultimately help more people. Few places depend on high quality data more than the Food and Drug Administration. It enables us to support scientific innovation and fulfill our unique role to help scientists and developers turn their vision into products uh, that are a reality for patients and consumers. It helps us to meet our uh, responsibilities to ensure these products are safe and effective for their intended use. And high quality data are needed throughout the product life cycle, not just to get it approved, but actually to follow that product that is used in the real world for post-market surveillance to make sure that devices are uh, continue to work as expected in real world use. But to fulfill these responsibilities, we must be able to integrate a wealth of available data for effective regulatory decision making. Data itself, while useful, is not necessarily transformative. We have to turn it into smart data that's aggregated and linked and usable and, and then connect cutting edge scientific discoveries uh, to real world products and solutions for a difference in patients' lives. And at FDA, we're working with innovative researchers uh, in a number of key areas. So we are establishing new linkages between complex data sets and making them available. We are harnessing the topic of real world data. We are employing these novel analytical approaches, all in the name of enhancing innovation and providing better information for those who need to make better medical choices. An example of this that is worth mentioning and pointing out, I think, is from the Center for De uh, Devices and Radiologic Health, or CDRH, at the FDA that's been working through a public-private partnership to create the National Evaluation System for Health Technology, or NEST. And this merges several disparate uh, sets of health systems data to allow studies of device safety and efficacy in real-world use for things like post-market surveillance and label expansion, and is, in my opinion, a, a good idea, given the diversity of products in medical device land. We're continuing to speed development of effective therapeutics by promoting innovative clinical trials, uh, such as platform trials and basket trials and adaptive clinical trials and pragmatic randomized controlled trials. And these are things that the uh, FDA has provided guidance on how we would uh, consider such data and use them for decision making. And these designs can be more efficient and they can speed accrual and they can lower costs. And we're also trying to make full use of the uh, expedited and accelerated approval pathways that we've been granted fast track and breakthrough and accelerated approval and priority review. These are programs that Congress mandated uh, that we use to help uh, speed development for therapies for serious medical unmet need. That's not to say we're abandoning the traditional ways that researchers at FDA have been conducting trials, but rather that we're building on that hierarchy and strengthening it uh, so that we can uh, use these new forms of evidence uh, as the methodologies prove. And of course, increasingly, we're learning from the input of patients. That is really, uh, I think the FDA has done a good job of incorporating the patient voice more into our decision making and will continue to do so. We're building multidisciplinary structures across the FDA to support uh, more efficient decision making. So an example of this would be the Oncology Center of Excellence, which coordinates cancer activities and review from disparate parts of the agency, so multiple centers. 
to allow more efficient review of cancer applications. I think that's one of the more famous uh, trans FDA initiatives that we've taken on. But we also have similar uh, trans FDA initiatives related to a, uh, art, the use of artificial intelligence across the agency and advanced manufacturing, for example. Uh, and a key technical solution of, of one of these trans FDA problems is how we will use cloud computing and storage uh, across the agency. And we've jumped into cloud computing in quite a large way, already using this technology in innovative ways. For example, allowing sponsors and reviewers to exchange messages and data sets in real time. This is related to the late, greater topic of information technology infrastructure uh, and real data storage usage at the FDA, which is providing some challenges. And I'm pleased to say that in the next few weeks, we will be announcing a new FDA plan for modernizing FDA's technology infrastructure that will allow us to use these sorts of data sets more efficiently. So we can consider topics like real world evidence and other sorts of uh, data sets more facilely across the agency. So as you can see, the FDA is committed to advancing new approaches to gathering data. But let me end on a final point uh, about the critical uh, role the FDA plays at the nexus between leveraging data for speedy development of new products while also ensuring the integrity of the data and of the process. Everyone here understands that the FDA is being pushed to approve newer and better and safer and more effective medical products and to do so as quickly as possible. But the key, of course, is that we're also asked to maintain the FDA's gold standards of safety and efficacy for medical products. And this requires striking a balance. A balancing point uh, really is the health and well-being of the patient and of the public health. Uh, unfortunately, finding this balance and explaining it to the public can at times be problematic for the FDA. On one hand, it's rare to find anyone who uh, is seeking a new treatment for a new disease who will complain that the FDA is moving too fast. But on the other hand, there are some who believe that these faster approvals and these expedited pathways we're using uh, must involve a lower of standards for approval of products. And I want to state that I don't believe anything could be further from the truth. I think in this regard, we can have it both ways, both faster, more nimble approvals at the same time of preserving safety and efficacy for our patients. The reason we, that I think that's possible is what's really changed is this basic understanding of, of, of cancer and, and, and these improvements in clinical research so that we know much more now today about developing effective therapies and new treatments. Take another example from cancer. When I started practicing, uh, randomized blinded placebo trials were a common thing in oncology. They were a standard way of telling if a drug was efficacious. And for obvious reasons, patients really hated this. They really did not like to go to placebo-controlled randomized trials. But we had to do it, we felt at the time, because we didn't really feel like we had credible alternatives. Uh, over the years, though, we learned a great deal about the biology and pace of cancer and the biomarkers and heterogeneity and subsetting of cancer. And in short, we really developed a whole new paradigm for treating that disease. And we came to understand we didn't necessarily need placebo controls, and often, and usually, in fact, don't need placebo controls. And we can make a lot of progress in various variety of cancers without uh, including placebos. And the FDA, in fact, just put a final guidance on this topic recently, saying uh, we'd like to minimize use of placebo controls in cancer trials. So there's still a few places where it's reasonable for certain types of endpoints, like in support of oncology, but it's rare for therapeutic endpoint now. And uh, I would say we found uh, ways to make progress using other approaches, and this is great news for patients. You know, nobody with metastatic pancreatic cancer wants to get randomized to a sugar pill. So uh, it's also more efficient, though. Consider some pediatric cancers that aren't just, there just aren't enough patients to really do effective trials. And so the use of these traditional large randomized settings is, is hard. And so these smaller, more innovative trials allow us to make progress in those sorts of diseases too. And you know, using these approaches, we've seen, as I alluded, enormous progress in cancer. I mentioned the melanoma example. But we also have similar stories in lung cancer and breast cancer and pediatric leukemia, many other cancers. And the goal now, I think, is to replicate that success to some degree over other areas where we've seen less therapeutic progress. For example, neurodegenerative diseases, where the biology is still very complex and poorly understood. And uh, you know, without further scientific understanding of some diseases, you know, th that will help greatly. Uh, which brings me back to where I started, which is, uh, and we really where Research America comes in, and it's the crit critical importance and need for more biomedical research yielding the best data. This is you know, critical to the agency's work. And let me dwell here for a moment on what I mean by good as opposed to bad data. Every day there's uh, research that offers great promise. Uh, but some uh, of the rapid desire for progress can translate into uh, the pitch for taking a shortcut with the FDA. 
i.e. collecting, uh, not collecting good data, but rather collecting bad data, and then submitting this bad data to us in support of a medical product application, for example. So data can be bad for a few reasons. Uh, two, most, two important causes are that it's a slip, sloppy, slipshod research, or that there's actual data falsification. It can be difficult for the FDA to tell these two things apart, because they're really they're dif they differ in terms of intent. But in one sense, it, it doesn't matter that much to the agency. If we use bad data for regulatory decision, then we can make a, a decision that harms a patient. So let me specifically comment on the problem of, of data fraud. When I was an editor at the Journal of Clinical Investigation, uh, we decided we wanted to see more of the primary data from the authors uh, when they submitted their papers. And I, I thought this was sort of a, an unnecessary endeavor. I thought it was a nicety. And then we rapidly appreciated that many authors were submitting, frankly, fa fabricated blots to the journal at, 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 a, at a degree that really surprised me and uh, I had not expected. Uh, and then later, when I was at the National Cancer Institute, I similarly saw that people would mislead us in grant applications. So it's probably not surprising that if someone will uh, use bad data or data manipulation to get their paper published, or they will do that to get their grant funded, then they will also consider doing that to get their, million dollar, their billion dollar medical product approved. But we simply cannot tolerate deception of any kind at the FDA. Now, I want to be clear, I don't want to imply that this is rampant. I think this is, these are rare cases. And I also don't want to imply that we think this is on the upswing. In fact, we have no data to suggest that. Such cases may even be becoming more rare. But we do see data fraud at the FDA, and more than I would have expected prior to coming to the agency. And, we, and, and, and I would argue that while these instances are rare, they are significant, because even a few examples of this can really damage the public confidence in the approval process. So think about you know, today's modern, nimble, effective, fast, every, every FDA that everybody desires requires that those who submit applications and data be truthful. And when that doesn't happen, the whole social compact breaks down. If someone comes to the FDA with data that's inaccurate, or if they submit an application that contains a false claim, it undermines the search for treatment or a cure, it violates the public trust, it raises costs, it exposes patients to needless therapies, it gives science a bad name, and most importantly, it hurts patients. At FDA, we don't have the resources to check every aspect of these submissions, every bit of research. We do have a lot of checks on data quality that we implement, and they're vigorous. But at some level, we have to trust the sponsors. That's the way the system works. But we will be vigilant concerning the accuracy of the research we review. And when we do identify data fraud, we will use the full range of our authorities to address this, including civil and, in some cases, criminal penalties. I would argue that good data is really, you know, that we can't really enforce our way out of this. It's really the, the product of good culture. And, uh, uh, and, and good culture in science is the product of a vibrant and good scientific community. And this is a place where I think Research America can, can clearly be of help by continuing your work to promote a scientific culture that values data integrity to protect patients. I know this is an area about which, you know, data integrity is an area about which we all care deeply. And I look forward to working more with this group in the future on this topic. So thank you for the invitation to speak today. And I look forward to working in this area more. We're all grateful, uh, Ned, to your um, taking the reins at the FDA, and we look forward to the day that we'll be addressing you as the permanent commissioner of the FDA. I know probably everybody in this room is working uh, to that day, and that maybe will be the signal that he'll then have the second best year of his life. <laughs> and we all will as a result of that. So this, this concludes our program today. I want to thank Pfizer, first of all, our lead sponsor, and all of our generous supporters and outstanding panelists who have made this day a special one. Thank you in the room and for joining us online. Um, you've, you've inspired us to make our next 30 years working with you and your fellow leaders in research, in, in research and public health just as high impact as these last 30 have been.
I salute you. I look forward to that. And I applaud you for the work you do every day, as the commissioner just said, to help more people. That's what we're all, all about. And it feels good. So have a great rest of the day. Thanks again.